It's been over a decade since the war in Libya, and the nation is still ruled by warlord factions, unable to build state institutions or hold free elections. The vacuum of power in Libya directly led to the weapons and terror funneled into the Sahal region, which contributed to a string of recent military coups. The instability also caused a migrant crisis that reached all the way into Europe. The collapse of the Libyan government led to a rise in extreme groups inside Egypt that spilled over into Israel. The purpose of this video is to analyze the events and decisions that ultimately led to this catastrophe, because I think there are some valuable lessons to be learned about the limits of US military intervention, as well as the horrors caused by ruthless dictators. It's my hope that if we examine the past, there might be some important takeaways to help avoid similar outcomes in the future. A quick disclaimer, we're gonna be talking about some difficult subject matter like the effects of colonialism, authoritarianism, and foreign military intervention. So if you have a different point of view or perspective, please let me know, I'm always trying to improve my reports each time with your help. The action that set Libya on its modern day trajectory was Italy's 1911 military invasion across the Mediterranean Sea. 34,000 Italian troops seized control of Libya from the weakened Ottoman Empire. Italy wanted Libya's agricultural land, vital raw materials, and most importantly, a foothold on the African continent to expand their economic trade. Take a look at the geography of the Mediterranean Sea on Libya's coast. It serves as a central maritime link between Southern Europe, Northern Africa, and Western Asia facilitating trade and cultural exchange. The economic importance of this land across the Mediterranean Sea has always led to conflict all the way back to the Punic Wars in 264 BC, fought between ancient Rome and Carthage. Once in control, Italian soldiers forced 100,000 Libyan Bedouin herders on a forced march to camps where thousands passed away. Italy then relocated 100,000 of their own citizens to assume control of the farmland in Libya. But this effort was short-lived because in 1940, British and Allied forces initiated a military campaign in North Africa, including Libya, as part of their fight against Italy, which had aligned itself with Nazi Germany during World War II. Muammar Gaddafi was born in 1942 in one of these Bedouin tribes that faced persecution by Italian soldiers. In 1943, just a year later, Allied forces successfully liberated Libya. Approximately 78,000 military personnel from Britain, France, and the United States were casualties during the campaign to liberate North Africa from the Axis powers. Britain maintained control during a transitional period, and in 1949, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution supporting Libyan independence, favoring the Sensui monarchy under King Idris. During this time period after World War II, the colonial period was ending, and many countries in Africa and around the world were being given their independence but there was a pattern of conflicts where people rejected what they perceived as illegitimate rule forced upon them by Western-backed powers. But before we get into that, turns out Ridge is a brand new series of wedding band rings for men. Just like their wallets, the Ridge beveled ring set uses premium materials and are guaranteed for life. From carbon fiber and tungsten carbide to titanium, or just good old fashioned 24 karat gold, these rings are designed by Ridge to be built for life, from cooking to hunting to working out and everything else. The outer beveled edge and inner convex shape provide a real nice, comfortable fit and feel, made custom to your ring size for the perfect fit. And since Ridge is all about lifelong products, they even provide two replacements whether you lose the ring or lose those 10 pounds. Each ring even comes with a dual band silicone companion ring to support for more casual situations and a really cool travel case to keep your rings safe when you're not wearing them. And just like their wallets, Ridge rings come in a variety of different colors, styles, and finishes, so they've got something for everyone. Click the link in the description or head over to ridge.com slash taskandpurpose to check them out and make sure to use code taskandpurpose at checkout to get 10% off. Further complicating things, in 1959, major oil reserves were discovered inside Libya when Gaddafi was just 17 years old. It must have been like his country won a multi-billion dollar lottery. Suddenly, your next door neighbor hits you up asking for money. Out of nowhere, the United States is interested in being your best friend. But the problem was, Libya didn't have the skilled labor, machinery, or capital needed to successfully extract the oil. King Idris struck a deal with foreign Western oil companies that some believe was unfair for Libya. 
Under the agreement, foreign petroleum companies would create the mining infrastructure inside Libya in exchange for control of a majority share of the revenue. From Gaddafi's point of view, he saw Western countries once again taking advantage of his nation's resources and their vulnerable situation. In 1963, Gaddafi joined the military in Libya and created a revolutionary group with cells of troops that were loyal to him. In 1969, he led a coup d'etat against King Idris, who he believed was too friendly with the West. He then abolished the monarchy, kicking out any of the remaining Italian people from the country, and established the Libyan Arab Republic. This new government identified with the ideals of sovereignty, socialism, and unity. Most importantly, Gaddafi demanded renegotiation of the oil contracts with foreign companies. He threatened to completely shut off oil production to the West if it wasn't agreed that they would give him better terms. Gaddafi said, quote, My people have lived without oil for 5,000 years. We can live without it again in order to attain their legitimate rights. The American oil company Occidental gave in to his demands and Libya became the first developing country to successfully secure a majority share of their revenues from their own oil resources. After this, it set a precedent and other Arab nations demanded the same equal treatment. There's this geopolitical concept called geographic determinism that I think is important to understand when talking about a nation like Libya that depends so heavily on one single resource like oil. Geographic determinism suggests that your nation's climate, natural resources, and geography play a significant role in determining your people's cultural development and history. For example, the people of Libya didn't get to choose where their coastline was or where their oil reserves were placed, but this is the hand that was dealt to them. This concept has actually been used to support the theory that the arid climate of the Sahara Desert, located in Libya, formed millions of years ago, contributed to this region's isolation today. Now, this theory has fallen out of favor recently because it's kind of rude to suggest that the Libyan people have no agency of their own, and it completely ignores how human beings are able to adapt and overcome these natural constraints. And ultimately, how Gaddafi chose to play this hand was his choice to make. Right after taking power, Gaddafi actually did try to use his newfound oil funds to help his citizens. From 1969 until 1975, the standard of living, life expectancy, and literacy inside Libya all grew rapidly. Gaddafi's government attempted to provide free education, healthcare, and promised free housing for all his people. This is what's called the authoritarian bargain, where the people pledge their loyalty and give up personal freedoms in return for economic benefits. There was a serious housing crisis in Libya at the time. However, local building contractors inside Libya were inexperienced in how to correctly build large housing projects. This ironically led to near total dependence on foreign companies. Gaddafi made the problem worse by creating socialist laws that stated, quote, no one has the right to build a house additional to his own for the purpose of renting it. This prevented the private sector from having any incentive to build property in Libya. We'll see this is the very thing that will come back to haunt Gaddafi later. According to Gaddafi's Green Book Manifesto, he wanted to unite the entire African continent under one single rule that would make them powerful enough to stand up to foreign intervention. Starting in 1978, Gaddafi launched military campaigns into neighboring Chad in an attempt to acquire a strip of land that was rich in uranium deposits, a resource necessary for developing nuclear weapons. The French military intervened with 3,500 soldiers and bomber aircraft to protect Chad. They successfully stopped Gaddafi from illegally seizing this land. It's times like this where you could see where people might get selective memory and only remember the times where military intervention successfully stopped wider war. Gaddafi also led military campaigns into Egypt in the late 1970s, further destabilizing the North African region. His armies included very young soldiers, and he was famous for making political opponents disappear. He was known for his unique, personal style that included flowing robes, sunglasses, and elaborate headgear. When he traveled to a foreign country, he would set up a giant Bedouin tent outside like he was still a nomad traveling the desert. These actions earned him many nicknames like the Mad Dog of the Middle East. Gaddafi didn't have the same set of tools to project power as the United States. He didn't have the ability to build aircraft carriers, but he could use his massive oil revenues to fund unconventional means to attain power. He backed an endless string of clandestine attacks abroad, like the 1972 Munich Olympics and the IRA bombings in Britain. In 1972, he attempted to buy a nuclear weapon from the People's Republic of China. After the deal fell through, he tried again with Pakistan and India, which also failed. 
but he still had one other power lever, the oil. After the 1973 oil crisis, when the rest of the Arab world had lifted their oil embargoes, Gaddafi refused, further isolating him internationally. Gaddafi needed to secure powerful friends in order to stay in power. He turned to Russia and other members of the Eastern Bloc. There's a popular Bedouin saying that I think helps explain Gaddafi's foreign policy. I and my brother are against my cousin. I and my cousin are against the stranger. The Eastern Bloc was the cousin, and the Western powers were the stranger in this instance. So by the 1980s, after a decade of tit-for-tat conflict with the United States, Gaddafi was in a weakened position. In the 1980s, oil prices had dropped from their peak of $30 per barrel to $12, which meant Gaddafi's revenue was significantly slashed. His ability to make good on those promises of free social programs and housing was falling apart, which is always a bad sign for a dictator. To make matters worse for him, the United Nations sanctioned Libya in 1992, making the housing crisis even worse when it reached a shortage of 70,000 homes at its peak. Gaddafi was not following through on his promises to provide for his people, but one last window of opportunity was about to open for him. You might think that after decades of sponsoring terror attacks across the world, Gaddafi would cheer on the September 11th terror attacks in New York City. But instead, he did the exact opposite, describing the attacks as quote-unquote horrifying. And he urged Muslims and aid groups to join international assistance efforts in the United States. He said, quote, regardless of political considerations or differences between America and the peoples of the world. On December 19, 2003, Gaddafi made a shocking announcement. He agreed to dismantle his nuclear weapons program, and his government took responsibility for past terror attacks on civilians, even offering compensation to the victims. But why the change of heart all of a sudden? He might have recognized the gravity of the situation in the United States and wanted to avoid any repercussions or any potential regime change or an invasion inside his own nation. During the subsequent war on terror, many dictators like Gaddafi worldwide sought to use the label of quote unquote extremist terrorism to brand the existing opposition rebel groups within their own countries. So basically the authoritarian Gaddafi was trying to crush any resistance movements inside his own nation. In response to Libya's cooperation and disarmament efforts, the United Nations lifted sanctions and the United States removed Libya from its list of state sponsors of terrorism in 2007. This positive shift in relations was further emphasized when the United States utilized Libya's air base during Operation Enduring Freedom inside Afghanistan. It seemed like tensions between Libya and Western nations were finally easing for the first time, paving the way for a more positive and cooperative relationship. However, the people of Libya had grown disillusioned with Gaddafi's unfulfilled promises. Despite his four decades long rule, the citizens continued to endure poverty while awaiting the constructions of the homes that they'd been promised. Meanwhile, Gaddafi had amassed a substantial private fortune for himself and his family. Him and his inner circle lived a lavish lifestyle. The spark that ignited the desire for change by the people of Libya can be linked to a broader regional trend. It's possible that after seeing the dictator Saddam Hussein toppled, nearby Arab countries began yearning for freedom from oppressive rule. This sentiment culminated in what was called the 2011 Arab Spring, characterized by a series of uprising and armed rebellions that rapidly spread throughout the Arab world. The overarching demands of this movement included solutions to issues like unemployment, human rights abuses, and political corruption. In neighboring Tunisia and Egypt, long-standing rulers were overthrown, setting off a wave of regime change and intense conflict across the region. The first signs of widespread protests inside Libya emerged on January 13, 2011, as the people began to voice their grievances. The catalyst for these protests was the demand for the very housing that Gaddafi had pledged to provide when he initially assumed power in 1969. These protests swiftly evolved into a full-fledged uprising by February 2011. In response, various rebel factions coalesced under the banner of what was called the National Transitional Council, with the shared objective of toppling Gaddafi. This marked the onset of a full-blown civil war in the country. The seeds of war are often planted decades or centuries before bullets and shells are even fired. By the end of February, rebel NTC forces had seized half the country from Gaddafi's Tripoli-based regime. Gaddafi's forces approached Benghazi to stop them, stating, quote, We're coming tonight and there will be no mercy. 
The world watched on, certain a massacre was about to happen. Journalists covering the conflict had already been targeted and killed. Gaddafi had already ordered indiscriminate artillery and cluster bomb shelling of civilians at the siege of Mistrada. It was these atrocities that led to the NTC rebel group begging the international community to enforce a no-fly zone over Libya to stop Gaddafi's aerial bombardment. The Arab League, which is a coalition of 22 different member states in the region, agreed to this idea of a no-fly zone. The fact that the Arab League asked for intervention lent credibility to any foreign action because it appeared like the region itself was asking for help. The UN Security Council vote resulted in 10 members in favor, none opposed, and 5 abstentions from Germany, Brazil, India, China, and Russia. Operation Unified Protector began, and a no-fly zone was enforced. Ultimately, a coalition of 17 different countries, led by US Air Force power, intervened in Libya. But the fact remains, the coalition was largely led and supported by NATO and the United States. It wouldn't have happened without the United States go-ahead. What we're about to learn is the unintended, sometimes negative consequences that military intervention can have. A-10 ground attack aircraft, B-2 stealth bombers, were guided onto targets by a number of elite CIA operatives who were already on the ground inside Libya. These CIA operators worked out of safe houses and annexes on the ground to gather intelligence and send coordinates for precision-guided airstrikes on Gaddafi's armored elements. These were launched from the USS Enterprise, one of the United States Navy Nimitz-class aircraft carriers. Its air wing carried out strike missions and provided air support during the entire operation. We're gonna learn how two aircraft carriers can topple entire governments, because the French also sent their Charles de Gaulle carrier in support. But what exactly was the goal here? Was it to stop the war, or was it to overthrow Gaddafi? If the plan was to get rid of the ruthless dictator, what would replace him? Our military mission in Libya is clear and focused. Along with our allies and partners, we're enforcing the mandate of the United Nations Security Council. We're protecting the Libyan people from Gaddafi's forces. The mandate Obama is talking about is what's called the right to protect policy. This was adopted only six years prior at the 2005 NATO World Summit. The quote unquote right to protect asserted that the international community had a responsibility to intervene in cases where a state failed to protect its own citizens from mass atrocities. After only nine days of American air bombardment, Gaddafi's forces lost air superiority, and they lost the ability to bomb civilians or enemy targets. However, US military involvement didn't stop there. By September 20th, NATO had flown a total of 23,350 sorties. They'd spent more than $700 million in the course of only two months. At this point, practically all nations recognized the NTC rebel group as the legitimate government in Libya. By September 15th, 2011, NTC forces encircled the last holdout of Gaddafi's loyalist troops. Gaddafi tried to escape encirclement. He departed Sirte in a convoy of 75 vehicles, and he would make his last stand only a few miles away from where he was born. At 8.30 a.m. local time, NATO assault aircraft struck Gaddafi's convoy with air-to-ground missiles. The official NATO press release from the Times states, quote, the vehicle had a substantial number of mounted weapons and ammunition, posing a significant threat to the local civilian population. The NATO statement goes on to say, quote, as a matter of policy, NATO does not target individuals. We later learned from open sources and allied intelligence that Gaddafi was in the convoy and that the strike likely contributed to his capture. So would the NTC rebels have defeated Gaddafi without the United Nations support? I think it's unlikely. They needed those American bombers. And so whether intentional or not, the NATO strikes led to Gaddafi being overthrown. Upon his capture, he was brutally beaten before being murdered while begging for his life. There were no judicial processes here. Critics will say there was also no judicial process for the civilians that he killed. Human Rights Watch called for an investigation into his treatment, but it was never carried out in the chaotic wake of his death. In the aftermath of Gaddafi's murder, some rejoiced, while others believed the entire affair to be another case of heavy-handed Western imperialism. It raises questions about what happens once you defeat your enemy. Sometimes the situation can be worse off than before. Sometimes it's better to fight the devil you know, so to speak. In the wake of the power vacuum, Libya descended into further chaos as fighting erupted between various factions and militias, all vying for power. The United States was not prepared for the aftermath and forgot that one thing air power cannot secure is a political outcome on the ground. 
This instability continued intermittently into late 2022, and even into 2023 there was sporadic fighting. Weapons flooded across the Libyan border, into the Sahal region, into the nations of Mali, Chad, and Niger. Approximately 1 million Libyan refugees fled to these neighboring countries who may not have been prepared for the humanitarian crisis. For many years, Italy and the EU had been paying Gaddafi to enforce Europe's sea borders to prevent migration across the Mediterranean Sea. Once Gaddafi was gone, the sea routes to Europe were no longer blocked off. Muammar Gaddafi was a brutal dictator. He was born a Bedouin, and he was part of a group that from his point of view had been mistreated by the colonizers of Italy. Even though the British and allied powers had liberated Libya in World War II, he believed they took advantage of his country afterwards by trying to control the newfound oil resources located there. Gaddafi dreamed of a united African continent, but as a dictator, he ultimately was unable to create the strong institutions and military power necessary to do so. This is because those groups would have had enough competing power to overthrow him, so he kept everyone relatively weak. Hopefully by analyzing the series of events, we can learn how to recognize what patterns lead to war in order to avoid them in the future. I think one lesson is, even if you have the upper hand against an opponent, if you take advantage of them in a treaty or trade deal or oil deal in an unfair way, it'll come back to haunt everyone. Something else that stood out to me is how people have selective memory when it comes to military intervention. Oftentimes we only remember the times where it worked or didn't work. One thing military interventions that fail have in common though is when mission creep sets in and the original limited goals change from simply peacekeeping to a larger task. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Thank you for watching. If you found something valuable, please consider hitting the like and subscribe button. And I'll see you guys again in a couple of days.